Welcome, everybody, to our fifth episode of Plant Prescription, uh, where we talk about common consumer questions uh, and troubleshooting, you know, questions that they have on plants, possibly bugs, uh, and a lot of other things. And um, as we've introduced ourselves before, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Michelle, an IPM manager at Costa Farms, and this is... I'm Justin, a horticulturist here at Costa Farms. And I can't believe this is number five already. I know. I know. We're really on a roll here. And, and we hope all of you listening are enjoying this as much as we are. Sorry about it, that, Michelle. No, it's okay. But I was going to say the questions keep getting like better and better. I really, really, really like seeing these questions because um, I feel like you and I have thought about these things over the years, but we've never like vocalized them. You know what I'm kind of afraid of is the question that's going to come in and stump us where, you know, we'll read it and then we'll be like, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> we'll circle back to that one. It's going to happen, but well, maybe not. I'd like to think that you and I are, we've got a lot of experience under our belts. So if we don't have the answer, we can maybe just make our what what would Justin do in that situation? <laughs> All right. So let's just, you want to just jump right into the first one? All right. Let's jump in. Okay. So to, oh. Go ahead. All right. So today's first question comes from Katie in Maple Grove, Minnesota. Um, and this is one that we, we actually get a lot. Um, I'd like to save my tropical hibiscus because it's so pretty, but I know it's not going to survive outside this winter here in Minnesota. How can I keep it alive? Ooh, in Minnesota. Yeah, you definitely can't keep it outside in Minnesota. Um, well, uh, I've never had a tropical hibiscus. I've been around a lot of them, but I've had some plants like uh, I've got some elocations outside that I bring in in the winter. Um, and my dad used to do this all the time growing up and depending on the plant would kind of determine where it went. If it was a bulb kind of plant, he would cut it off or even honestly, and this is going to sound really intense, but even alocasias, he would kind of chop them and dig that tuber up and put it in the basement. But if it's a hibiscus, it doesn't really have a bulb. You can't really do that. Um, I hope that it's easy enough to dig out of the ground and put into a pot. And I would honestly recommend doing that before winter hits um, because it, you don't want to add too much stress because this is going to stress the plant, but it'll survive if you dig it up, put it in a pot and then put it inside. And because it's a hibiscus, I would try to put it in the brightest location that you have, but keep it away from the window so it won't get that like cold window draft because if it's if plants are too close to the windows they can still get cold damage um from that but i would definitely recommend trying to dig that up and put it into a pot and just kind of letting it acclimate to that for a little while before you bring it inside is that what you would do justin Absolutely. You know, as somebody who grew up in Minnesota and then spent 10 years in Iowa, I, I have a lot of experience because I do love my hibiscus um, and I have hauled many, many, many hibiscus in over winter. Um, they're not the best houseplant because they need so much light, but they can get by indoors, especially if you have a bright spot, um, either natural, artificial or a mix of light. Um, my biggest tip for successfully bringing, well, two tips. One is to make sure you do it well before it starts to get cold. Um, because if it gets like in the in the low 50s, upper 40s, then your hibiscus might start to to experience some stress. And the cold stress on top of moving it in stress is is just not good. Um, the other thing is to give it a good haircut. Um, mm -hmm. And like I would cut mine back by like half because all of the leaves on the plant, those are used to growing outside. When you move it in, all of those leaves are going to drop. Um, mm -hmm. And A, it's alarming. B, it's messy. So if you prune your plant and then you bring it right inside, all of that new growth is going to come out adapted to inside light. So it's not going to drop off. It'll be less messy um, and it'll make you feel less like, oh, my God, my plant is dying. Yeah. OK, I could see how a hibiscus would do that. It does need a lot of light and it's not going to look pretty. I mean, even the new growth coming out probably didn't look like strong and 
you know, it probably looked a little bit like, did it look like a lighter color than the stuff, than the uh, leaves that were grown outside? Yeah, a little bit. But by the end of the winter, you lose most of the the old leaves anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I would I would traditionally get, you know, maybe half a dozen, 10 flowers over the course of the over the winter. Um, how how long did you do this for? How many winters did you did you take this in and out for? Um, probably. Well, it was different hibiscus. Um, mm. Probably, probably 15 years in total. OK, yeah, I was thinking that you could probably do this over and over again. Um, but your plant would just get bigger and bigger and harder and harder to move. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I got a hibiscus that I liked better, you know, then I would kind of phase out, OK, these are the ones that are going to come in and these are the ones that are going to get sacrificed. Because it's so horrible. I think like everybody, there's only so much room. It's so bad. You, I've done it. I've sacrificed some plants. And sometimes it's like, well, we'll see if you make it. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Um, exactly. And when it comes down to it, unfortunately, a hibiscus is going to get left out in the cold before a passion flower any day. Yes, clearly. That's a solid choice on your end. Pass the floras before, before everything. Before your before your chickens and your dogs, the passiflora comes first. Well, maybe not the dogs. Yeah, that's that's kind of extreme. I really hope you wouldn't do that because dogs are awesome. So are chickens, for that matter. Anyway, um, okay. Uh, next question. All right, question number two. Uh, this is from Camille in Linden, New Jersey. Help! I found a mealy bug on my three-year-old golden pothos. What do I do? <laughs> All right, so the very first thing that jumps into my mind, if you see a mealybug, there's not just one. So I uh, hate to alarm you, Camille, but get out the magnifying glass. I hate to alarm you even more, but burn it, destroy it, <laughs> bury it 100 feet underground, throw it in the ocean, whatever you have to do. <laughs> okay, we're really alarming you right now just because, uh, like, I think we both experienced mealybugs, and it has been such a grueling process and it's some like you think you're done with it but like justin says there's probably more somewhere else and then they just pop up and they go undetected and they lay 600 plus eggs and then before you know it you've got uh mealybugs all over again so don't mean to scare you but they're really 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 difficult to take care of mealybugs and scale are like the trickiest ones but not all is lost it depends if you really love your plants um you can make this work however i would say you know it, it you, you have one mealybug but if anyone were to ever have a plant that was like covered in mealybug sacrifice it put it out in the winter <laughs> take your passiflora inside instead because it's really if you if you have one okay but if your plant is white uh it just it's not worth it because it's just gonna really affect all of your other plants um so the it, the tricky thing is that they have this this white waxy coating um yeah. and this coating is i don't want to say impervious it's um, but it's it, yes it's resistant to a lot of sprays um, and so, you know, while you can use insecticidal soap or some of these other products on aphids and white flies, um, this this darn coating is like a suit of armor on the on the scale and the mealybugs. It is, yeah. And you know, so mealybugs, all stages except yeah. for one, will have this waxy coating. Um, and the stage that doesn't is the crawler. And so the eggs have the waxy coating. They're like kind of in this wax blob for back, <laughs> lack of a better term. Um, and it's really ironic, honestly, I'm just gonna sidetrack really here, right, right here really quickly, that eggs are like, honestly, when you're looking at insects, bugs, for the lack of, we're just gonna like simplify and call it bugs. We'll get into that later. But bugs, when you look at bugs, the eggs are honestly always the more durable, 90% of the time, are more durable than the other stages of its life because that's its genetic offspring and that's like the hope for the future of these guys. And so mealybug eggs, really difficult. You can squish them, but nothing is getting in there, like insecticide, water-wise. And then, I mean, if you look at other bug eggs really quickly because we're going to do that aphid eggs over winter 
they can survive a freeze. Like no other bug, I, like like aphids themselves can't survive a freeze, but their eggs can. And it's like really cool when you really think about how resilient eggs are for bugs. But once the mealy bugs hatch out of these super resilient eggs, that is the one time that they are not covered in wax. And that's the little crawler stage. And Michelle, um, mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's share with everybody why they're called crawlers, because a, you know, it sounds creepy, even though that's when they're most vulnerable, but also, also it's really cool because they're crawlers um so they go through two instars to reach adulthood but crawlers i i mean I, they're not so crawlers for white fly are crawlers because after they crawl they kind of hunker down and they become immobile but when it mealy bugs they're pretty much always active they're just not sexually mature but Crawlers was kind of like, instead of saying um, like a nymph stage, you could also call it the nymph stage, but crawlers is way more fun because it gives you the heebie-jeebies. But I mean, they're just kind of, it's when they hatch out of their egg and they're not covered in waxy filaments. Crawlers, if you're talking white fly, means something totally different um, because that is like the stage where they're like active and then they'll settle down and become immobile. So crawlers for scale is is another situation where they hatch out and they crawl around and then scale adults. If you've ever seen scale, they look like little bumps on plants. They're immobile. And so the crawler stage is the stage where they're going to move around and find their spot and then kind of hunker down. Um, so that's true for scale and for white fly, they'll kind of crawl out and hunker down. And then for, for white fly, they'll mature into adults for scale. Well, they're just there forever. And I hope they chose a good spot because they ain't moving. Um, anyway, so crawler stage for going back to mealybugs, though, is they hatch out of the egg and they are not yet covered in wax. They have to cover themselves in wax. So this is the one stage where they are susceptible to sprays. But good luck trying to, like, get them in that stage because what's going to happen is you're going to have, like, an egg sac here, adults there, yada, yada. You may have one or two crawlers, but ah, spraying insecticides is really not going to help you for the most part. Um, the crawlers can also go surprisingly long distances, as I have unfortunately learned from personal experience. Oh, no. What? I mean, you how know, far? And they're fast. How far you know, did like, your crawler go? Well, they've gone from room to room. <laughs> oh, oh, side, 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 side thing. Um, so everybody's used to seeing the mealybugs, like the, the white, squishy, gross looking um waxy looking things but those are just the females mature females or or immature stages you really don't see a difference until they like mature to the final to their adult stage but males are actually tiny little flies um they don't look what? anything yeah you oh good I'm, I'm glad you're learning something um because like, it's hard to, it's hard because you know a lot of things so but anyway male white fly or male mealybugs look like they fly little, Yes, they're like little tiny flies and they can have all sorts of like pale lengths and they're they're really studly looking, but really they just look like little gnats. Do not look like mealybugs at all. And the funny part is they have no mouth parts. Um so their <laughs> their sole purpose is to find a lady and uh try to ensure their genetics go on and you know Chicka, chicka, that kind of thing. Like that is their sole purpose. They do not eat. Um, they look like little gnats and you would never, honestly, probably, those are probably traveling long distances. Doesn't really matter though because they can't lay the eggs. But yeah, don't be surprised if you see mealybugs, if you see these little like fly looking things, it could be males. Because only the females are like the big, kind of like they waddle. Have you ever noticed they waddle when they walk? They do, like yeah waddling mealybugs and as much as I hate them it is kind of fun to like watch them waddle and they'll like waddle away so fast and they're not going that fast um yeah okay, the adults so are much much slower than the than the crawlers I take your word on that I haven't really seen many crawlers but the adults are not super fast um so I could I could imagine that um but 
going back to the whole waxy filament thing, sprays are not going to work that well for you on mealybugs. Even if you get really good coverage in the plant, it's not going to penetrate that wax. Um, I have seen a lot of people use uh, the alcohol uh, with a Q-tip, um, and that's great if you truly only have one. Definitely doesn't hurt to go in with an alcohol and kill those, or, I mean, you may as well, you could just smush them if you're you know, strong stomached like I am. It's satisfying to smush mealybugs at this point, but you could always just smush them and kind of smush them off the leaf uh, or stem. A lot of times they're on the stem, but you could do alcohol. One time my mealybugs, I had really horrible mealybugs once. And one time I was so desperate, I took a spray bottle and like sprayed my plants with isopropyl alcohol and uh, it didn't work. And my plants really hated it. I don't recommend doing that. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to defoliate, especially thin leaf plants. Desperate times, Justin, desperate times. Yeah. I have a giant plant collection and it almost compromised all of them. And it only takes one plant. It's like they're like little mm -hmm. Trojan horse bugs, you know, and they'll just come in and like little Trojan horse, you don't see it. And then all of a sudden they're so hard to get rid of and they do get on your other plants. Um, they have a and really so what, broad host range too. Go ahead. What do you think about a mixture of the alcohol Q-tip method with using a uh, systemic insecticide? Uh, systemic insecticides are the, are the kind that um, get absorbed into the plant, so they make the plant poisonous to the pest. I honestly think that is probably your best option. Um, keep in mind with systemic insecticides, just make sure you read the label um, because some of these may have bee boxes. Um, and so treating your house plants, not a problem at all. If you have a bee in your house, you know, it happens. It's not going to go and try to pollinate your house plants. And if it does, it's a very, very confused bee. Um, and it's got a lot of other issues. So, but just read the, read the label. Um, and in your house plants, it's, it's safe. Um, a couple of things in regards to drenching systemic insecticides. Number one, for mealybugs, probably the best thing you can do. Um, uh, I would personally, from experience, recommend imidacloprid or dinatefrin. Um, look for those active ingredients. There's others as well, uh, but for from my experience, I've had really good luck with those. Um, number two, though, if you have pets, make sure they do not drink the water coming out the bottom of those plants um, because there are chemicals in those now, and you do not want your plants to drink or your cats to drink that. And then number three, systemic insecticides will work. It does take time though. And in that time, if you if you drench this chemical, right, what's happening is the plant is going to slowly take this up with its root system. But if you water it too much in that time period before it can take up the chemical, what you're going to do is you're going to wash the chemical out of the soil. And then you're not going to get the desired results. So make sure you give it time. When I treated my plants, I almost lost my collection of mealybugs. This is like hitting home for me. But when I treated my plants, I gave it a month where I was like very diligent about not getting any leachate, any water coming out the bottom of the pot after I applied that um, insecticide drench because I didn't want to wash it out. So it did take about, for me personally, in my growing conditions inside, it took about two months to start seeing results and then three months they were gone and it worked so well but be patient because systemic insecticides are not overnight so like justin mentioned maybe going with a q-tip especially the egg sacs make sure if you see egg sacs you kill them because there could be 600 plus baby mealybugs waiting to come out and just like munch on your plant in that little sack so if you see egg sacs destroy it murder it throw it in the ocean, torch it, bury it six, 600 feet underground, whatever you have to do, just like kill the egg sacs, kill the babies. You always, you always want to kill the babies, um, which is really horrible. Please, I hope nobody ever like, clips that part out, but you'd want to go, babies is the way to go. Make sure they do not hatch. Um, and yeah, just, just pray. One other thing too, in terms of... It, 
you know, if you either go with the alcohol uh, remedy or you mix the alcohol with the systemic, um, is that you can't just say, all right, I did the alcohol once and expect it to be done. You know, it's really satisfying watching the the white blobs turn um, color as they, they die from the alcohol. Uh, but that sense of satisfaction um, is something that you you need to repeat. Um, I recommend on a weekly basis, you know, giving your plants a thorough inspection for any new um, crawlers that have come out or, or any egg sacs that you might have missed um, and just do it repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. Unfortunately, mealybugs can never be killed with one application of anything alone. No. Yeah, it's really, they're really tough. And, you know, I love bios. I would want to throw in a little anecdote about them. This is probably one of the very few pests that do not have very good biocontrol for homeowners, at, at least. Um, there are some bios on the market. There are, are beneficials, same bios as beneficials. Um, there is obviously lacewing. Again, adults will not be carnivorous. They're literally just feeding on pollen nectar. Get the larva or the eggs of the lacewing, and they're going to be okay, but they may not fix it for you because it's not really their favorite food. They'll eat it, but, I mean, the best thing for mealybugs is called, ironically enough, a mealybug destroyer, which is my favorite bio um, because... It, it Latin name is Cryptolamus. Mealybug destroyer is the common name, and it does what it says. It destroys mealybugs. And the coolest thing about this bio, which makes it my favorite one, um, don't tell the other bios I said that, um, is that uh, as its larval form, this guy's a beetle as an adult. It's a black beetle with like a brown head, kind of, a, it, it's in the lady beetle family. Um, but as a larva, these are uh, complete metamorphosis bugs, so they look like different things for each stage of their life, basically. Complete metamorphosis. The larval form looks like a little alligator most of the time, um, but this larva looks just like a mealybug. It is amazing. And they did this, so they evolved this way because mealybugs, like aphids, like whitefly, uh, they basically poop sugar. Um, they have honeydew is what they poop out and ants love their poop and the sugar and ants will kind of protect and harvest the mealybugs as well. And in order to get past those mealybug defenses or bodyguards, uh, Cryptolamus mealybug destroyer has evolved to mimic their prey in larval form so that ants don't pick them up and kill them. And it's super cool. They will destroy mealybugs at all life stages. So as soon as the sky hatches, it's going to go nom on its neighbors and sis well, last sisters are not related, but neighbors. Um, and the <laughs> mealybugs are probably like, yo, dude, what the heck? Like you are eating me and you look just like me. This isn't cool. Cannibalism isn't allowed in our society, but they don't care. They're going to keep doing it anyway. Cause lo and hold the wolf and sheepskin, they're, mealybug destroyers and then obviously the adult beetles will also eat a lot of mealybugs and the coolest part about using these they're fantastic to use outdoors i think if you were to use them indoors they would be very confused um and they probably would not perform that well they also need a lot of mealybugs they're not going to be satisfied with just a couple here and there so if you are a homeowner with a garden whoever has in a whoever has like a giant infestation of mealybugs and like your plant outside is white I would recommend trying Cryptolamus, not indoors though, um, because in the trial garden at Costa Farms, we had a mealybug infestation. The tree was white. Like, do you remember this, Justin? I do. It was disgusting. It was nasty. It was white. And um, uh, the IPM manager at the time in that location said, let me just try this. He got some Cryptolamus in. We released them and they went right to work. And the coolest part about these was that they left no signs of mealybugs. All the waxy residue, everything was gone. Because unlike most bugs, they actually enjoy eating the whole mealybug, wax and all, which is really rare. And we should all give them a round of applause because that's kind of nasty. But they will work very well outdoors for you. Um, unfortunately, indoors, so, chemicals. I actually tried them once uh, back Did when you? I lived in Iowa. I did. 
Um, and, and your favorite thing about them was my least favorite thing about them. What, that they look like the, mealybugs? Yes, because I never really knew, is this a mealybug or is this a mealybug destroyer larvae? Oh. And, you know, and so that, I had to stop. I had to stop using the alcohol treatment um, <gasps> because I didn't want to kill any of the good guys, but I couldn't yeah. tell the good guys from the bad guys. Oh, and then the adults. Guys. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not saying I killed them. I, had to, I said I had to stop killing what, you know, because I didn't know what was good and what was bad. And so, you know, it sort of took away my 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 feeling of, hey, I'm really doing something along with these guys. The other thing as a homeowner that doesn't work out so well um, is that like ladybugs, um, the adults rush to the windows. Uh, um, and no matter how uh -huh. many times you ferry them back physically to the plant and say, here's what you want to eat, stay <laughs> here, they just go back to the window. I just, I can envision you like scooping it up, be like, no, your food's here. It's right here. Come back. I know I you try and that. reason with them and they just, they don't listen. Okay, going back to the misidentification part, they look very similar to mealybugs, but you can tell them apart um, if you look at them hard and long enough um, because the mealybug filaments, like those waxy filaments, are going to be a little bit like thinner, uh, and the mealybug destroyer filaments typically look like dreadlocks compared to the actual mealybugs. They're much larger and thicker, and they look dr dready. They're dreadheads. Where were you 20 years ago in my life? I uh, dreaming of the day we would have this conversation, oh. I'm sure, even though I didn't know what million book destroyers were yet. But um, I'm glad you tried to use them in your house. I, <laughs> I wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> desperate Not... times. Desperate times. You can't make fun of me for dousing my plant with alcohol now because you get desperate. <laughs> I have done the same thing as well. Oh, well. And yeah, passion flowers do not like straight alcohol on their leaves. Pretty much everything I've tried it with, because I tried yeah. it with a couple of plants. So would not recommend that. Um, all right, should we move on to something a little more pleasant? Yes. Good luck with your millie bugs. May the force be with you. Uh, question number three. Kelly in Gresham, Oregon here says, I have a shingle vine. It's grown past the top of its board. What the heck do I do with it now? <laughs> Well, uh, you could do what I did, which I would not recommend, um, and let it grow up your wall. Don't recommend that, though, uh, because the roots will definitely rip the paint off. Um, plant's going to get nice and big, but you don't want to damage your wall. Justin, what would you do? So the advice I like to give people is um, extend the frame by getting another piece of wood and then like hot gluing copper tubing to both sides so you have a nice little, you know, artistic looking extension and then you can just you know let it grow up and then when it time comes time to to transplant into a bigger pot you can you know get a bigger one i've heard of a lot of people who carefully peel it off the board um and then they'll put it like on a moss pole mm -hmm. yeah I, I think that you could do that um uh, you could also, if you're short on time and resources and it's really kind of out of control, you could try to gently train it back down and up again or around. Um, I've got one that's going a little crazy. Um, it's It's gone around this, like the, the wood piece, like three times now. It's actually kind of, it's behind me. Um, nice. And it's, it's gone around a couple of times now. So you could do that. Um, uh, what I would recommend though um, is... A lot of the the climbing plants that need totem poles or something to climb up, um, I've seen a lot of people just like putting wood into the pot, which, you know, if you're going to do that spring for the like the cedar or something that's less prone to rot, but even that over time is going to rot. And then it's happened to me, you have this plant in this pot and it's forever home and the, all of a sudden the rot takes over and the thing falls. So. I would recommend if you're going to do that, um, take uh, some aluminum, flat pieces of aluminum. You can find them in your home improvement stores. And they're really easy to work with. They're very flexible. They're very easy to screw through. Um, try to take at least one or two of those, bend it, and bring it all the way up the back. Well, not all the way. Up, up the back to the point where it's out of the soil. So you have like this little um, people who can't see me on, on YouTube right now. You have like this little um, foot that you make. You make like a 
like a V or like an you, L. Encase the wood in the in the aluminum so that it doesn't stay wet with the well, soil. Well, you could, but I just like to create like a little L and then um, put the base of the wood on the on the bottom L part and then take the long L part or the long piece of aluminum channel up the wood and make sure that that aluminum channel goes up or the aluminum bars. I'm sorry, the aluminum flat pieces, not channel go above the soil surface. Um, because that way, if your wood does rot, which it will, um, you've still got the aluminum in there and the bottom, the little L piece on the bottom, you put that on the bottom before you put your soil in. Cause that's going to kind of keep this thing stable in there from tipping over one way or another, because the wood is probably going to rot cause it's in moisture constantly. Um, and so, but that'll keep you from having a timber moment one day. And it's simple and it's cheap. It's really easy to work with. You don't need a saw. You could just bend it and bend it and like snap it. You don't need any fancy tools, just a drill. I would and, recommend doing that though. And and fun fact, Kelly, your shingle vine doesn't actually need a support. Um, that's the way it grows in nature. Uh, but you can just let it trail from a basket or, or grow horizontally um, on a surface as long as you keep it moving so it doesn't root in. Um, the one, I guess, downside of that is that in order for the leaves to stay flat and have their shingling effect, it needs to be up against something. Um, if it's not growing right up against something, it'll be more like pothos, you know, where they're just kind of normal leaves. Hmm. I've always liked how the shingler leaves get larger, the taller, it, the higher it goes and how they can get like really big. And then they're just like flat against the wall. That's kind of why... Wouldn't recommend it, but that's kind of why I let mine crawl up the wall um, is because I loved the look and it looks like art on the wall. It totally destroys your wall, by the way, completely destroys it. Um, but I would use like little thumbtacks and like to the, not like thumbtack through the stem, but to the side of the stem and kind of like wedge them in there. And then before you knew it, the, the roots grabbed onto the wall. Do not recommend that though. I'm just saying it did look cool because they get giant the taller up, the higher up they go. Oh, you know, if you wanted to do something big like that over time and you lived in a place where architectural salvage was inexpensive, you could get like an old wood door from an architectural salvage place, uh, lean that up against your wall um, and then let it climb up that. that that'd be really be cool. Really fun. That'd be really cool. I um, There's a girl on Instagram and she has built this super cool um, like planter box, right? And then on the back end of the box, she's got this frame going up, kind of like a workbench. You know how you have the back going up against the wall? And in that section, she put... Um, she like had some wood and she put some screening in and then stuffed it with moss. And so she had this like moss wall connected to her planters and it like spanned six, eight feet. And it was so cool because she wow. planted a bunch of plants in these like boxes and then had them grow up this moss wall. And you could do like, like a lot of plants in there. You don't have to the the thing that's really tedious about totem poles, which is why I don't keep up with them as much as I should, is like each pot needs its own one. And it was really cool to see her do this like trough with the back, with the moss wall, because she was able to put everything in there. It was really that's cool. That's amazing. But that's like for the for the DIYer who is like super gung-ho, because it looked like a lot of work. All right. So we hope that helps, Kelly. Um, and anybody who's uh, listening to this, if you want to share your solutions for extending the the crawling space for your shingle vine, um, drop us an email at questions at costafarms.com. We'd love to see it. Yes, please. I'm always looking for ways to improve because that's a that's a tricky one. Um, let's move on to our myth busting segment. Dun dun dun. Um, so one that we see a fair amount, um, people say they, they feel like they need to get grow lights, um, special grow lights for their plants because there's not enough natural light in their apartment or home. What do you think about that, Michelle? Special grow lights, huh? Hmm. I've seen, I've seen a lot of quote unquote grow lights, but 
a lot. There's still so much research that's being done on light spectrum and plant responses and what's the best spectrum that somebody kind of saying that this is specifically for plants. I would want to see a lot of research behind this. Um, personally, I've tried a couple of grow lights, so to say, and I just maybe it's the ones I got, but I really don't like them um, because well, you know, in in general, you know, you're paying for marketing. Yes. More so than you're you're paying for a product that's significantly better. Yes. And most of the time, from what I've seen, these grow lights tend to have a red-ish kind of hue to them, which does not vibe with my uh, the aesthetic I'm going for. And it would really annoy me when I would look in the corner and I would see like a purplish reddish light versus I just went out and got some like LED T5s, LED T4s, T8s, whatever it is, like the little LED um, garage lights, so to say. And those are like bright white, very clean white. And by the way, white means you know, you've got a full spectrum there. It's not leaning one way or the other. And so I got those and I put those in and my plants have done phenomenal with those. Also, honestly, um, I grew a ZZ plant under just um, a bed light, you know, like the little bed lamps, the like incandescent kind of looking bulbs. That thing grew with that light. Like you don't, from, I just don't think you need a special light. You know, if you want to go and get a special light because, you know, you feel like it's going to, it works better, that's totally up to you. But I don't think that anybody needs to feel obligated to go with specific grow lights. Just get the brightest light you can, the brightest thing. Exactly. At the end of the day, light is light to the plant. You know, the plant really cares about the intensity, not the source. When and, we're talking you know, house plants. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, so so light coming through your window is great. You know, an LED is great. A fluorescent is great. A specially formulated grow bulb that has, you know, that weird purple light, you know, also also great. Um, but really, it's it's which one do you want to pay for? Yeah. Uh, personally, because I'm a little bit on the cheap side, I'd rather put my money Ditto. into the plants than the uh, than the accessories. Yep. Ditto. Ditto, ditto. Also, the LED light, the LED kind of like strip lights are great because you can find them in all different sizes. You could even do, oh, okay. I want to do a section on lighting because I've done a lot of things because my, like, the aesthetic of how things look is very important to me. And, like, random grow lights everywhere does not mesh with that. It's not feng shui. So, but what I did a couple of times is that you got those, like, pendant, the Edison bulbs, and you could even put, like, high intensity white lights in those and then you could do like um a, like a metal uh cage over the bulbs to give it that like um industrial and, thank you yeah the industrial look and so and then you could hang it from branches from the ceilings like you can do a lot and make your lights look like part of your aesthetic um but from what i see the reddish kind of lights they'll work they're just not you know pleasant on the eyes in my opinion some people may really like that and that's fine you do you that is fine i personally just prefer white light me too all right uh plant update so i have some very like personally very good and exciting news Ooh. um i have had a calathea orbifolia um probably five years now. Um, and as you know, Calathea and I, except for network, don't really get along very well. Um, and so my solution was to wick and grow it. Uh, ah. Wick and grow is a self-watering system that Costa does. Um, I was able to to get an old, old pot um, that had the wick and grow wick in it. I pulled it out. I put it up the drainage hole of my Calathea orbifolia. Um, and I had it in this really nice ceramic pot um, in my greenhouse. And it was growing and it was growing and it was growing. And um, it was it was severely root bound. And every time I looked at it, I'm like, you know, I need to add this to my list of things to do. But mm -hmm. then something would distract me. And so I never really got around to repotting it. And then we had the heat dome here in, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and it was like 125 in my greenhouse, even with the doors open. Oh, my God. Um, 
And the Calathea orbifolia, I thought at the time it was the combination of the heat and being root bound, um, did it in. Uh, but then I also realized um, that because it was hot and I was doing a little extra watering and it was in a ceramic pot without drainage, that it was hot um, and root bound and completely waterlogged. Hmm. Um, but being the lazy person that I am, I put it on the I put it on a shelf so that I could take it out to the the compost because the compost pile is not right next to my greenhouse. Um, and I saw last night that it has new shoots coming up. And so somehow this incredibly fussy Calathea orbifolia has defied all odds um, <laughs> and it's bouncing back. What a comeback kid story. That is awesome. Also so, five-year-old Calathea. Wow. I know. I know. I didn't think I was capable, even though I'm a, I'm a horticulturist. So moral <laughs> of the story, don't necessarily be too quick to give up on your plants. They just might surprise you. I literally had similar situations with Calatheas, and it's very ironic, but the reason mine died is because it's so ironic. I knew I had spider mites, and I was like, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, and then I never did, and they love Calatheas, and I had one that got hit super hard by spider mites. Oh. I know. Honestly, they sucked kind of it dry. Fun, yeah, it was kind of fun because I was like, ah, oh, it's easy. I'll just put person list down. It was two spotted spider mites. So I was like, I'll just, and I did, and it was fine. But the old foliage got like whooped. And so I basically cut this thing right at the bottom and I said, we'll see what happens. And yeah, sure enough, it's very sad looking Calathea, but I got a couple of leaves coming back. Nice. I'm ashamed to admit that I let a plant almost die because of bugs <laughs> when you work with them all day you kind of are like oh, all right i i know you it's like people with the gasoline right when you have a tank of listen where i'm going i i got a point to this when you when you're driving and you start running out of gas there's two kinds of people the people who like run it to the edge and say i know my car i know i know its limits and then there's the people who like automatically fill up at a quarter of a tank i am the one who like knows her limits with her gas tank and I, with my plants as well. So I push those things. I, I kind of put them through the ringer sometimes. But kind of, a, you you're, you strike me as the fill up the tank kind of person. Oh, yeah. I never go less than half a tank. Yeah. Oh, oh no. My, I, my gas light has to come on before I fill that tank, which was really inconvenient when we had some gas shortages because my gas light was on. Um, and then it was no longer fun and games. Anyway. I, I have also lived in a lot of rural places. Um, and, you know, done road trips uh, through Iowa. Um, and sometimes it may be 30 miles to the next gas station. Uh, and yeah. so, you know, um, having been stranded on the side of the road once, it's like <laughs> never, ever, ever doing this again. I want to hear about that story one day. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, we will wrap this up so uh, so Michelle can pry that story out of me. Um, <laughs> today's episode was sponsored by Raphidophora. Um, shingle plant is a stunning and architectural plant uh, that looks like it belongs in an art center or your home. Look for shingle plant at your favorite local retailer. And until next time, happy gardening from your friends at Costa Farms. I'm Justin. I'm Michelle. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Adios.